I would say it's an honor to be able to speak here in front of all of you today. Uh, the title of this talk is Learning to Understand Identifying Interactions via the Mobius Transform. Don't expect you to know what that means, but maybe by the end of the talk, you will. This is joint work with some fellow PhD students, F.A. and Landon, as well as Professor Ramton Pedersani from UC Santa Barbara and my supervisor, Professor Kanan Ramchandran, who sends all his well wishes to all of you and is, uh, unfortunately wasn't able to be here. Okay, so this is the motivation behind this talk. Uh, we have some review. In this case, this is a review of Shannon's mathematical theory of communication. And we pass that through some language model. And this language model is designed to tell us the sentiment of this review, whether it was a good review or, or you know, a negative review. And obviously, there's something wrong with this language model because there are no negative reviews of this paper. And so, so something is going on here, right? Uh, and the question is, can we understand what parts of this text is triggering this language model to give it this score, or this erroneous score? So this is a typical solution. The idea is basically to just mask off certain parts of the text, right? And see if the sentiment goes up or down. So let's say we mask off some of the text and the sentiment goes up. Clearly, that part of the text is probably contributing to the negative sentiment. And depending on how much it goes up, that might tell us something about to what degree that, that part of the text was contributing. And so designing these masks is actually a very interesting problem. Uh, and yeah, this talk is actually also secretly about sparse graphs and group testing. And <laughs> that's all that's really going on here. So uh, yeah, uh, as you'll see, actually, very interestingly, we will design these masks using group testing matrices, but in very non-obvious ways. Okay, so this is the standard way that people are doing this right now. Uh, they use this package called SHAP. It's from uh, University of Washington. And it's based on this game theoretic notion of importance called the Shapley value. And what the Shapley value does is basically assign a score to each word, or in this case, group of words to save on computational complexity. And it's real, the score that it gives is related to the average marginal contribution to the overall score that that word or a group of words provides. And so I added this here just to show that this is a very, very popular package. Uh, I mean, I think the paper that this is based on is about six years old and has well over 10,000 citations. So, so yeah, it's very, very well used. And we were looking at this and we were seeing if there's any way we can improve on, on this approach. And two things I think we can do is one is, you know, is it possible to make it faster? Can we use fewer overall masking patterns? And two, can we somehow extract higher order information? Because th this is kind of like building a first order model. I'll explain exactly what that means. So this is an example of a higher order model. And so if we have here, this is a, a new, a new review here, her acting never fails to impress. Clearly this is a positive review. And, and this model that we've trained gives it a score of point, plus 0.91. I think the score is from minus one to one. And th this comes from a BERT model that's been fine-tuned on the IMDB data set. So it knows about movie reviews. And we can see if we look at like the first order scores of some of these words, words like never and fails, they have profound negative sentiment, right? If you see the word never, you see the word fails, you think bad, right? But English is, is complicated, right? And when you add the word, have the word never and fails together, that means something profoundly positive. Okay? And so this is a really important second order effect. And I'd also like to point out that, you know, I, I'm not making up that, that people care about these types of things because since we started publicizing this a few weeks ago, I've gotten quite a few emails from people who are very interested in up to, they say about third order interactions. So what's really going on here? It's really just function decomposition, right? But we have this complicated function and we're gonna model it sort of with a Boolean function. At one, the input bit one corresponds to not masking the word, input bit zero corresponds to masking that word. And really what we're taking is kind of like a Fourier transform. So just like you have some complicated function and you want to take its Fourier transform and you pull out the important frequency components, here we're trying to pull out understandable 
and important components uh, of the speech. Okay, and so I'll talk about exactly how we get these scores. But the idea is basically a signal processing approach to explanations. And we can decompose this, this Boolean function that I was talking about in terms of uh, a polynomial, right? just like you would do with a Hadamard transform. So how do we construct this polynomial? We basically take the, these scores that I have and multiply them by the corresponding bit uh, that matches the word. So in this case, the third word, we add m3 minus 0.44. And we have fails is the fourth word, we have minus 0 0.96, and we repeat this process over and over again for all the words. Uh, now, for the second order terms, we look at the product, so of the third and fourth word, never fails, uh, and this is representing basically an and of the two bits, right? That would take multiplication. And so, if we're not masking any of the words, what do we do? We replace all the bits with one, and we add them up, and we get 0 0.91. Right, okay. So what if we wanted to evaluate this with masking the third word, never? Okay, we do that, and we set all the places where the third bit exists, we set that to zero, and then we add up, and we get 0 0.93. Okay, this, this makes sense, right? Because her acting fails to impress is, uh, the reviewer is not saying something good about her, her acting. So everything is sort of consistent. And so this type of transform that I just took, it, it's called a Mobius transform. I think that just comes from the fact that Mobius did something in number theory, and then this guy, Giancarlo Rota, said, oh, hey, this is actually the same thing for Boolean functions. But it, the main big picture here is that we're doing a transformation onto an AND basis. So all of the possible AND functions between all the bits of the inputs here are, uh, are sort of our basis vectors. And similar to how we would do with a Fourier transform with parity functions, uh, we're, we're doing this kind of progression. And we're going to use capital F to have the corresponding uh, Mobius coefficients, and little f is going to represent the function itself. So I just want to do a big little compare and contrast between the Hadamard Fourier transform and this Mobius transform, because I know many of you are probably familiar with Hadamard transform. So in both cases, they're a polynomial representation of the function. For the Hadamard transform, the bits are minus 1, 1. And for the Mobius transform, they're 0, 1. So this is what gives you the difference between a XOR basis and a AND basis. The Fourier transform has this beautiful property of being unitary, while the Mobius transform does not. And the thing with this Fourier transform, at least in the context that I'm talking about here, uh, it's really difficult to interpret these coefficients because we're looking at XORs of the bits. And, and so it doesn't work in the same way that I just explained to you with the Mobius. Uh, but for these AND functions, it's very easy to interpret. And of course, there's a long history of literature on how to efficiently compute Fourier transform, but that doesn't exist for the Mobius transform. Uh, and so I'm here to solve that basically, and show that, yes, actually, you also can efficiently compute this Mobius transform. So uh, just a quick history on the fast Fourier transform. So apparently, it goes all the way back to Gauss, who used it but didn't think it was important enough to publish. Uh, and then in the 1930s, someone named Frank Yates developed the fast Hadamard transform, which is the fast uh, Boolean Fourier transform. And then in the mid-1960s, Cooley and Tukey finally rediscovered the FFT, which is a very important discovery, as we all know. And then in modern history, or more modern era, uh, since the development of compressed sensing theory, many people have worked on sparse Fourier transforms. So uh, we have some work out of MIT from Peter Index group, uh, as well as Kanan, who worked on this back, back then as well, and many, many others who have uh, done some great work in this field. So I want to talk a little bit about what our signal model is, right? What kind of properties do we expect of these functions? And one of the things that we observe is that almost universally, there's only a small number of coefficients that, that are really large. Of course, we're talking about like an exponential space. There's two to the n coefficients. And among those, those exponential number of coefficients, really only a small fraction of them tend to be very large. And 
Uh, you can't see it very much here because there's only six words, but if you have a much longer sentence, it tends to be the case that only these low order interactions are, are the ones that are, are not. Obviously, there's, you know, there's a lot of small, non -neg negligible terms here, but uh, we're really interested from an explainability perspective in just the largest ones. And I'll also point out that uh, I'm not, I don't want to knock the Fourier transform, the Heidelberg transform here. It actually tends to, in many cases, has even better spectral properties. But, and we, we can actually take the Hadamard transform and go back to the Mobius transform if we need to. But um, for our purposes, because we're interested in this explainability, we want to focus on this Mobius transform. So uh, using the signal model, we can you know, do some, develop some theorems. Everyone loves theorems. So the first theorem here is just a standard compressed sensing uh, setting. So we assume we have a K-sparse Mobius transform, uh, exactly sparse, and we can achieve this with sample complexity kn. Again, k is the sparsity, n is the number of words. By sample complexity, I mean the number of times we need to mask and do inference. So we want that to be as small as possible. And the computational complexity here is kn squared. And this is kind of like an asymptotic result, but you can say something not asymptotic between two, but yeah, this, this works well for large k. And then the second theorem here, we focus on this low degree setting. So we say we're only interested in these words where, or in these uh, interactions between at most t words. In that case, the sample complexity can re be reduced to kt log n. And the time complexity is k poly n. In practice, I'm writing O here a lot. Uh, for a sample complexity, the largest constant is really just like six. Uh, and this poly is, is basically cubed. Uh, what's going on here is, is this poly is coming from a, a group testing decoding kind of part of our algorithm. And I'll also say that in this setting, we focus quite a bit on robustness because that's obviously very important. These things are not uh, exactly sparse, but we really just want to pick off those, those very important large interactions. And so at the very end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how the sparse, or how the, the robustness works. So just throwing some numbers around here. You know, this exponential space, if we have k equals 1,000 interactions and 100 words, and we're focused on t equals 4, that we're talking about, you know, naively this is 10 to the 30, forget about it. And with theorem 1, we're looking at kn is 10 to the 5, kt log n, uh, 2 times 6 times 10 to the 4. So this is you know, in the ballpark of possible things to do, because this is the number of times we have to mask. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the algorithm. So the first part of this algorithm is going to involve subsampling. Of course, as I said, there's, there's an enormous number of possible coefficients here, so we're going to have to subsample very aggressively. And, and this guy tells us a lot about subsampling. He tells us that uh, subsampling call, causes aliasing, and there is nothing we can do about that. So, so what are we going to do? We're going to embrace and understand the aliasing. All right, so by the way, these blue boxes are things I don't expect you to be able to read. Uh, these are, this is a, a, a first lemma. Uh, what we do here is we construct a matrix H, and we choose our masks according to that matrix H. It is exactly how we do that. I say it's not important, and it's very convoluted. But uh, what it results in is, is it results in a uh, understandable aliasing pattern. Basically, what we're, what's happening here is we're hashing all of these coefficients together according to this matrix H. Now, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that this arithmetic that's happening here is actually like monoid arithmetic. So instead of like F2, where you have XOR addition, this is like OR which is going on here. And so this is exactly what we see with group testing. Uh, and interestingly, if you're dealing with the Hadamard transform, this is exactly F2. And so that's where you can use error correcting codes and the parity check matrix. So error correcting code turns out to be a good hash function. But what's a good hash function here? So this is a, a quick example. We go back to, to that example I had earlier. And let's say we have these four <coughs> coefficients. These were the four biggest coefficients. And so I'm saying we have, let's say we have an exactly four sparse Mobius code uh, transform that we're trying to uncover. And we construct two subsampled functions. Basically what this is is we do masking and we sort of stack up 
the scores that we get from those masking patterns. The, the patterns themselves are given by this ones and zeros score here. And that results in some caching right, on once we take this Mobius transform of this subsample. And so you see this one, you know, didn't do too badly. <laughs> we got two of them that ended up being isolated, which is important. They're, they're singletons. That's ultimately what we want. Uh, yeah, as you'll see at the very end, this is just going to become Aloha again. So you know, they'll all come back to massive random and excess in the end. Uh, and, and the second thing that's going on here, uh, in this case, we did kind of a bad job hashing. They all got hashed together. And so, so the question is, how do we ensure good hashing? And as I've alluded to before, the, the answer turns out to be group testing. So group testing was originally proposed by Dorfman in the 1940s as an efficient way to test soldiers for syphilis. The main idea is to do pooled testing, which allows you to identify the infected individuals <coughs> with fewer tests. So this is a setting where we have eight individuals and two of them are infected, and we only have to do six tests to and so just like group testing allows you to find T infected individuals out of N total individuals, it also allows you to find T important words uh, out of N total words. And, um, and yeah, so because this arithmetic uh, of group testing is the same as the arithmetic of this hashing rule, it turns out that a good group testing matrix is a good hashing matrix. Okay, so the question of how do we ensure good hashing uh, had the answer of exploiting group testing. Uh, there's still more to do here. The question is how do we identify these singletons and multitons? And how do we find the ki? So, so what do I mean by that? So even if we do a good job hashing, we still need to figure out that, okay, there is actually only one coefficient in there. And we need to know what the k <laughs> is that corresponds to so we can cover the score. And the answer to that, thankfully, turns out to be that we can exploit group testing again. I'm not going to get into the details here, but a somewhat more complicated lemma that we can also design masks using a different group testing matrix. And what this will allow us to do is basically get linear projections of the particular k that we're interested in. By linear, I mean a, a, group, a single group testing test, basically. Uh, and so if we have a uniform prior, that is, we don't know that uh, these non-zero interactions are all low degree, this takes, we basically have to just use an individual testing procedure. And this takes n samples, and this is a multiplicative factor of n. But if we're dealing with this t degree setting, we can do this in order t log n. And the last part is, okay, now we've done hopefully a decent job hashing. We still need to kind of clean this up. Right? And so we can do erasure decoding. Okay, so we have you know, our, our singletons here, which we're able to recover and then subtract. And then now never, you know, we can also recover and subtract and recover and subtract. And of course, we are able to recover all of these coefficients in the end, which was our goal. So just a quick overview of everything that went on here. In the first step, we did hashing. This took, in this case, we took order k samples using a, a sampling pattern according to a group testing matrix. And in the second stage, we did this singleton identification and detection. It took uh, n samples, uh, from, this is a multiplicative factor of n samples under the uniform prior and t log n under this t degree assumption. And then finally, for the density evolution to work out for the erasure decoding, we have to repeat this process uh, order one times. Under our assumptions, it was three times. And this gives it, this is what gives us our sample complexity of Kn and our and Kt log n, respectively. Hey, and this is just some simulation. So these results, like I said, were asymptotic, but it works well, very well in these finite regimes as well. Uh, both, this is a phase transition diagram saying we're just matching up with theory, and we also have a fairly reasonable competition complexity to predict. Now I'll talk a little bit about robustness. So the way we model robustness is that we say basically that each of these bins is corrupted from many insignificant interactions adding up, and they're also being hashed into these bins, hopefully somewhat even more. 
And so we're, we're modeling this uh, here. I, I said Gaussian noise. I think like any uh, zero mean sub Gaussian two sided <laughs> noise is it, it, fine. Uh, but we're able to solve this simply by taking additional redundant group tests. And there's some, been some awesome work recently on noisy group testing theory, and we're able to port these results into our theoretical guarantees as well. And so here I've plotted some of our robustness. I'm plotting the error here as a function of the SNR. And this is a fixed redundancy. So for smaller t, this is essentially more redundant because t, our, our sample complexity is growing linearly in t. And you'll see that you know, for the more redundant cases, we're able to um, more efficiently, very, the error goes down faster, basically. And yeah, there, there's still some work to do here, obviously, and it can continue to improve robustness. But this is a, a reasonably robust approach. Now, there's one thing, one limitation I wanted to talk about for this particular algorithm, and that is that in our assumption here, we said that these non-zero interactions are chosen uniformly across the low degree interactions. But in real, particularly in language, this is not the case. If you have like an important third or fourth order interaction, usually within those four words, there'll be a lot of very important interactions as well. So that's one case where this kind of breaks down in the real world. Uh, however, we found that by using adaptive approaches, and you can design adaptive algorithms using non-adaptive group testing, uh, matrices or adaptive group testing matrices um, or, or adaptive group testing procedures, uh, we can basically eliminate this assumption and, and it works much better and it's much more robust. But there's still this question of can we eliminate these assumptions while remaining non-adaptive? Because we're doing inference here and, and so what we kind of want to do is batch all this up on, on a GPU. And so you know, I don't, adaptive is fine, but if we can do this in reasonably large batches, that would be very helpful. So just to wrap up, I wanted to talk quickly about some interesting applications. Uh, so I talked mostly about language here, but there's many other places where we can do this, and one of them is in images. So there's been some awesome work out of Berkeley from Yi Ma's group on creating uh, sparse featureizers using transformers for images. And so I'm really excited on, to try to apply what I've done here on top of what they've done, because they've done a great job, basically given us exactly the type of features that we need uh, to get these sort of sparse functions for explainability. And I'll also briefly mention that this approach is yeah, somehow secretly related to hypergraph sketching. Uh, and so just like direct application of an algorithm like this can uh, is state of the art for some types of uh, graph learning problems. And then finally, another area of application that we're very interested in is auction theory. So uh, the Mobius transform in particular is, you know, it's based on these ands, right? And when you think of value functions that people are interested in, uh, you know, in particular like spectrum auctions, it might be the case that we need two frequency bands that are very close together. And there's this synergistic and behavior to that, right? Uh, and, and, you know, so that, that's another thing we're thinking about. You know, can we do signal processing to help scale up uh, auctions and, and to execute them more efficiently? Finally, just to wrap up, so explaining deep models can be cast as a function decomposition problem, and signal processing and communication ideas can really provide a new perspective. Uh, there's lots of open problems, so we talked mostly about black box methods, but there's also lots of things you can do if you have access to uh, attention matrices or uh, just activation and things like that. And then uh, there's also this question of this connection between the attention and self-attention and Mobius transform, in particular, second-order Mobius coefficients and self-attention. There's some awesome work out of Christopher Ray's group at Stanford that's kind of trying to replace attention with FFT convolutions. Uh, and, and lastly, there's continuing to improve this, uh, the robustness of this approach with more real-world noise models. I was talking about earlier. With that, I'll wrap up. Thank you.